The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Our aim is to explore the fringe, lost civilizations, alternative science, the paranormal, and much more. Join us on the web at WhereDidTheRoadGo.com where you can send us questions for our live or future guests via email or the live chat room. And remember to subscribe to us on iTunes. And now welcome to this week's edition of Where Did The Road Go? So, this week on uh, Where Did The Road Go? We have with us Micah Hanks, the author of UFO Singularity and a whole lot of other stuff. Are you there with us, Micah? Absolutely. Glad to be here, too. And uh, your name is Micah, in case anyone's not hearing it correctly, (laughs) (laughs) M-I-C-A-H. That is right. Yes, I always appreciate it when hosts know how to pronounce my name. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And what you are into so many different things and so many aspects of the paranormal. Uh, it's almost mind-boggling. Your uh, your latest book is UFO Singularity, correct? Uh, yes, it is indeed. Yeah. Okay. Although there, right before that, there was another book actually that that came out that was a regional title. I live in the Appalachian Mountains, and it was a book about a place called the Reynolds Mansion. So those two actually came out very close to the same time. Technically, uh, the uh, the UFO Singularity is the most recent. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you have a, a bunch of books before that, don't you? Yeah, a good few. You know, I mean, I, a couple of self-published things and anthologies I contributed to. You know, I, I try and stay busy with the writing thing these days. It, it really is a passion. But if you want to, if you want to succeed and profit, you really just have to work hard. And and in this business, Soraya, nobody works harder than Nick Redfern. So I've already got my work cut out for me just knowing that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he seems to put something out every six months. <clears throat> oh, or, or even sooner than that. You know, Nick is. I, I would argue that uh, today. He is the most prolific uh, writer of fringe topics in the paranormal. Uh, he is, uh, and he's a good writer too. He's he's a damn good one. He's a, he's an interesting person, and uh, proud to call him a friend. He even wrote the foreword for the uh, book Magic Mysticism and the Molecule. Nice, I, nice. Yeah, that I came out with. Uh, gosh, what was it? Three years ago now. Time flies, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you're also you have a website called uh, and a podcast called The Grailian Report. Correct. Yes. And how long have you been doing that? Grayling Report has been, uh, I, I say this lovingly, but it's been a labor of love for the last five years. And uh, and it's been a lot of fun, too, because so much, and I'm sure that you know this, uh, you know, just as well as the majority of your listenership, so much has changed about media in just the last, you know, five, six years, especially in the last ten. And about ten years ago, when I first began publishing articles in magazines like Fate, you know, Mysteries Magazine, some of these others, um, that was still kind of the primary way that people got their name out. And um, about five years ago, I launched the Grayling Report in January. And, uh, it, you know, it began just a, a personal blog. As a matter of fact, the title, the Grayling Report, a lot of people ask what that is. And there's come to be kind of an entire mythos associated with what a Grayling is. And without getting into all that right now, my general conception had been to take a couple of words gray alien, the popular meme associated with alien abductions, take those two words and and put them together and make a singular term that was not something that anyone else used, that was not any place else on the web, because if you're thinking about things in terms of marketing on the web, if you're going to have a .com, you need to have a, you know, typically a small one or two word website, and you want something that obviously that nobody else already owns. And I thought, how better to ensure that I own a domain that no one else has than to just create a word. (laughs) But the late Philip Coppins, who I befriended, you know, literally just months before he passed away, he came on my program. Uh, And uh, when he was on the Graylian Report podcast, Philip said, uh, in reference to the Holy Grail, uh, you know, I think we were talking about synchronicity, synchromysticism and these sorts of things. And he said, and and such such divine processes are also what would allow two words like Grail and Alien to come together. And so even though that wasn't my intention, I think it's it's uh, it's sort of a tribute to Philip Coppins. I also incorporate a little of the Grail mythos from Arthurian legend into it just as well. So it has come to mean many things, but it is primarily today a news site that features a podcast, daily news updates, and then, of course, blog articles by myself and other contributors. Now, how many people do you have working on that? 
You know, it's still primarily me, but uh, my brother Caleb Hanks, who's also an engineer on the podcast, helps out. Tyler Pittman, who is a sociologist who works with us, he's also a contributor. Uh, Matthew Oakley, who's an independent journalist. We've also got a gen- gentleman who does religious anthropological studies named Chris Hayes, who's done some stuff for us in the past. The enigmatic red pill junkie, who's also a blogger for DailyGrail.com and um, another of my endeavors, Intrepid Magazine. Uh, he also is a contributor as well. And so, uh, you know, again, most of the articles that you find there are going to be mine because I've been the primary writer for the last uh, you know, five years. But slowly as time has gone on, I've not only been able to build up something of a, you know, kind of a, a I guess, a stronghold of people, you know, in this community who I know and who I trust and who are great minds and at times much more uh, cohesive and brilliant thinkers than, than myself. You know, not that I'd ever call myself brilliant. <laughs> Maldi may be brilliant. I don't know. But um you know, and I'm able to, to to draw from people who indeed really do have insight into areas of science and history and things that I don't. And so that's that's been part of the, the beauty of this. And there are a few others that I've been talking with. And I always, if people ever want to send along just, you know, a one-off uh, submissions, you know, from time to time, we just feature submissions from readers if they are, you know, topic-oriented. And, of course, you know, every now and then I think every person who has a, a website uh, that features you know alternative news they're going to get the the emails from people that you know want to write something about uh, you know <laughs> some some new supplement or something like that and you can see right through that so you know write me something about ufos and send it to info at graylyreport.com <laughs> but, but it's not specifically a ufo site is it it's really not no you, you, sir i the funny thing is, is that when i when i started this uh, well, my interest in, in, in ufology and, and cryptozoology and really, I guess, you know, just all things unexplained, it goes back to early childhood. Uh, I've, I've said this many times before during interviews and things that, you know, really I was about five or six years old when my father uh, first gave me books because I kept asking about these books. They'd tell me, ca- uh, you know, campfire stories about Bigfoot or about UFOs or about ghosts and you know, I was a few great, a uh, few grade levels ahead. By the time I was in kindergarten or first grade, I was already able to to kind of you know figure things out, and I was reading at about our third or fourth grade level. And uh, and of course, you know, while my teachers were all interested in trying to get me in, you know, advanced placement and all this stuff, they were wanting me to do math and all this stuff. I wasn't interested in it. I had no interest in that. I do now, but uh, math and science was far less interesting to me than folklore, mythology, literature. And so it, it helped me because I was able to really get into this at a very early age. And so by the time I was in my you know late teens, early 20s, and I started writing about this stuff very seriously, I'm only 30 right now, um, I really had already kind of amassed a lot of knowledge. But what's interesting is that it was kind of like, I remember the author Stephen King once said that writing a short story is a lot like taking a stone. And you know that there's a statue underneath, but you have to chisel away. It's not about how much you can add to something. It's you have to chisel away to reveal the sculpture beneath. And for me, I think that throughout childhood, my teenage years, reading, I mean seriously reading about these subjects and contemplating them deeply, pairing that with study of history and mythology and things. And then eventually also, you know, the physics angle, you know, the the, the physical science and, uh, you know, mathematics, all these kinds of things. You should be all inclusive. When I began to put it all together, um, and in my early to mid-20s, you know, really try and understand what is this all about? What is our reality attempting to offer to us with this with these apparent instances of anomalous phenomenon are these things that science can explain do these things conform to the laws of physics or are they purely bunk and perhaps something that's really more a matter of psychology rather than physics well i began looking into it when i was in college of course you know i I was talking to my psychology professors i was very interested about all this sociology and psychology of course became of utmost importance and then finally Uh, What it seemed to be for me was much like Stephen King said, it became a process of, okay, what can we weed out? What can we remove from the equation so as to better understand the underlying truths? And that's what I continue to try and do. And for doing so, I'm often labeled a skeptic by people. And at times in the past, I've also called myself a skeptic. And I think that more appropriately, rather than to say I am this or that, I'm neither a skeptic nor a believer. Um, I don't even prefer a term like agnostic. You know, I think I just am. And I'm someone who tries to look for the facts and see where the facts lay. You've got to be both open-minded, but also very rationally skeptical if you're really going to make headway in a, in a field like this. Well, I, I think the the term skeptic itself has kind of been hijacked a little bit by by debunkers, uh, where you get people, you know, skeptic means someone who asks questions, who questions everything, not somebody who just seeks to disprove or uphold the status quo. Absolutely. And what's funny is that, uh, you know, my, my friend Sharon Hill of a website called Doubtful News uh, recently, and, and the 
partially tongue in cheek, I should point out. You know, it's so funny that because so much goes on in the the Twitter sphere or in the, the the world of Facebook or on blogs or even from podcast to podcast, I get emails from from listeners of different shows that you know talk to me about you know such and such on this social media network or on this podcast was talking something you know they were talking smack about you again mike and i know these people are my friends and it's all tongue-in-cheek so i I always tell people first take everything with a grain of salt but you know uh albeit tongue-in-cheek uh uh, sharon had been joking about how she quote unquote uh, was skeptical of my skepticism because she said it's it doesn't just mean to question but i think in a classical sense of course, the ancient Greek skeptic philosophers, from which the modern term is derived, they actually were, were philosophers who questioned whether any knowledge can be obtained at all. And thereby, they sort of put themselves in a disposition where they felt that, well, if I abstain from, from making any kind of judgment, I can better and more objectively understand what I am capable of perceiving. Now, in the modern usage of the term, even according to dictionaries and the like, a skeptic can be defined as a doubter or, like you said, a person that questions everything. But, you know, I I think that you're right in terms of the hijacking of skepticism, Soraya, because what we have seen happen in recent years is the emergence of people who are what I would call outright denialists. They aren't just skeptical. They aren't just people who are questioning whether it be the status quo or extraordinary claims. There are people who literally will reject any kind of information so long as it doesn't fit a particular worldview that they have, which is, in my opinion, uh, literally the same thing as the overt believer who, in the absence of any actual practical knowledge, nonetheless chooses to believe because of a gut feeling that they have. And so, you know, the trick is is to find the common ground. I think that the rational center is a point of open-minded skepticism rather than being an extreme denialist or an extreme believer. You have to find common ground and you have to incorporate the best of both without allowing yourself to become encumbered and hindered by an ideology. And so much of this, as I'm sure you know, has just become ideological today. It's more ideological than it is logical. Oh, sure. And, and there's always an agenda so so often behind the, the skeptics or the true believers where they're just set on this is what we need to prove and this is what we're going to do. You know, something that in that in that line of thinking, something that troubles me is that uh, – I don't think that, uh, and again, just like the term skeptic, uh, I'm not afraid to say that I'm skeptical, but I'm hesitant anymore to call myself an outright skeptic because I find that I just turn so many people away. <laughs> and uh, and even as recently as uh, this early March, actually, about a month ago, I was at the International UFO Congress and I was giving a lecture, but of course being billed as probably the only skeptic there. Uh, you know, some of the other speakers are, of course, you know, friends of mine, Rich Dolan, Stanton Friedman, others that I don't know so well, like Jaime Massan, who'd been brought in, I think, at the last minute as a replacement speaker. You know, Jaime is someone who has time and time again put out some very, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't even call them uh, uh, extravagant, I would call them flamboyant claims. And and time and time again, a, a lot of the claims that he has made end up being shot down in, 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 in a, you know, a blazing flame and, <laughs> and ashes, you know, it's 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 terrible. You do have to be able to stand your ground if you're going to make extraordinary claims. And time and time again, those who make the most extraordinary claims do end up going down in flames, as as I've described. But but being the one guy who was, quote unquote, a skeptic at the UFO Congress, I made a lot of friends. And I also, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, the, the, the more emboldened UFO believers approached me and, you know, wanted to know. How can you how can you show your face around here? Why would you come to an event like this and be you you know we've already made made up our mind we don't need people like you coming around and I said well what do you mean by people like me you know uh, because in truth I don't think that we're any different we're both looking for answers it's just that my approach to to finding the answers is less oriented in outright belief and is more oriented around let's see where the facts point and what the facts point us toward we have to we if we're going to really understand anything whether it be ufology whether it be ghosts and hauntings whether it be cryptozoology we have to take seriously the 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 the, uh, the, the reality that we have to be able to you know basically prop up our our argument for or against anything with facts and and there are such things as proof and evidence but those two are not the same thing and i would say and i've said this time and time again especially with regard to ufo's there's a lot of evidence. There is a lot, perhaps a preponderance of evidence, and that shows something. But while we have a lot of evidence, I think that 
proof is something that we have not yet found or have been able to determine with the evidence available to us. And that's why I say, again, I think that I maintain a skeptical disposition for purposes of better weeding out the, the you know the evidences that are brought to the to the forefront, which are maybe less likely, and often this does happen. I think one of the, one of the biggest and, and best known cases in ufology uh, is the case uh, you know of course the, the Roswell crash of 1947 in, in Roswell, New Mexico. But you got to keep in mind with that one. I'm so often asked about it, and I would say that some of the UFO researchers, Kevin Randall and others who have been so intimately involved in the research of the Roswell UFO crash over the last several decades, many of them, after spending decades studying it, have begun to question maybe the original witness testimony provided by Jesse Marcel and, and, and certain others involved with that entire situation. I think that over the years there have been so many instances of information and misinformation that is either taken and misinterpreted or, or, or taken into the wrong context or, or outright bad information is thrown into the mix that has no basis in fact. And it really has allowed that entire situation to become incredibly convoluted and something that was once, I think, the very basis for you know serious study of UFOs. I think that Roswell today I don't doubt that something happened, but I question every day whether there was truly anything that we might liken to being an extraterrestrial spacecraft that crashed there. And personally, if I had to just give you a hardline answer, my gut tells me that there was nothing extraterrestrial that crashed at Roswell, New Mexico. But I don't say that to be dismissive or disrespectful to the ufologists who have put years and years and years of work into that case. What I do say, though, is that I think that if we are to really do those ufologists justice, we have to look at what the evidence and what the hard work that they put into it for decades, Stanton Friedman, Kevin Randall, and so many others, we have to take what their hard work has given us, look at it critically and carefully, and say, well, if there's less here than what we thought there was to begin with, let's move on and find a better instance of proof of whatever the UFO enigma is supposed to be. And that, too, is something I'm as yet undetermined about. I, I couldn't tell you what UFOs are. I think that there are probably several some things, not just ETs or extraterrestrials. Well, I, I think you can say with a fair amount of confidence that there's something going on, but defining, you know, as you said, defining that is very difficult. And I, I almost wonder if it's going to take a new understanding of reality itself to really comprehend it on any level. I, th I think you are absolutely right. And I'm glad you say that. You know, I think that the fundamental premise I'm bringing to the table with my book, The UFO Singularity, a lot of people, you know, they kind of, you know, glance through it. And uh, it's funny because one gentleman at the UFO Congress looked through the book and uh, had said to me, you know, I, I see that it's well written, but there's just not a lot of content. And I said, well, why do you say that? You know, I mean, I'm citing scientific journals. I'm citing, you know, a lot of different historical documents. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm interviewing people firsthand. And he says, yes, but he says, but you're, you're detracting from the interpretation of UFOs as extraterrestrial. And I think that there's enough information. This isn't me saying this. This was the individual. He said, I think that there's enough, you know, evidence to support an extraterrestrial hypothesis. And really, you know, you're not doing us any justice. You're not really adding anything by looking at this from an alternative perspective, which I guess he, like many others, have interpreted kind of peripherally as being, oh, Micah Hanks thinks that UFOs are all time travelers. That's not the case at all. In the book, although I certainly use the conventional terminology, time traveler, the actual argument I present is that in the future, perhaps humans who implement highly advanced technologies will no longer on a perceptual level have a need for literal time travel because, again, through perception alone, they may begin to actually look at space and time vastly differently from how humans chronologically are kind of, uh, you know, uh, to, to be to be put it to, to put it frankly, uh, right now we're kind of hindered biologically by our perception of space time. And what I mean by that is, for instance, right now I can say right now, but every time I say right now, that was a second ago. You know, we can remember biologically with our brains functioning much like a biomechanical or a bioelectric computer. We can remember the past, but we can't perceive the future. And yet, many of the provable, testable, and repeatable facets of Einstein's, uh, you know, relativity theory have begun to show us that time is not the immovable constant that, that we always think it is. And the book I use as a general example, something that I think a lot of people who even have a cursory knowledge of science and physics are, are well aware of, which is time dilation. And it shows that 
it's not that a, a clock that is moved at a great speed and further away from the gravitational pull of the Earth actually stops running or runs more slowly based on the gravitational pull. What happens is, is that if you have two synchronized clocks and you put one on an aircraft and fly it halfway around the world at a high altitude and at a great speed, the actual warpage, the bending of space-time, relative between uh, to the space between the two clocks actually causes the time to it's the time relative to the clock itself is remaining the same but when the two clocks are brought back together you see that there's a bit of a disparity because time is relative to certain things such as the influence of gravity such as the speed at which a body is passing through space and time and so taking all these things into consideration we begin to see that i mean heck you know if you're a human being and you're walking down the sidewalk at lunchtime and you're walking down the street to the sandwich shop because your feet are closer to the earth's surface gravity is being exerted differently against your feet than it is against your head and your brain because of the against the you know the, the relative distance from your you know your earlobes to the ground time is passing differently between your head and between your feet but it's such a minute difference that it's imperceptible and that's the whole point is that humans aren't capable of perceiving often these subtle little variances, these little, well, if you, if you really like, I like to say these kind of, uh, you know, these little elements about space-time that we find are quite malleable. They're not constant like we once thought they were. And so will we, and this is the question I ask, I couldn't tell you whether or not this will ever happen if we don't destroy ourselves before maybe we get to this <laughs> point, you know, but, um, but I do question whether technology one day will literally allow us to do such things as perhaps enhance brain function, Perhaps it will, you know, for all we know, actually allow such things as synthetic telepathy or ESP and, and precognitive abilities. Precognition, being able to predict the future, would have to have to uh, do with the human brain finding some way to literally perceive space and time differently from how biologically we are equipped to do so today. And so the general argument I make with the UFO singularity is that although I couldn't begin to tell you if these technologies will be created, I do have at least a fairly good idea of what kinds of technologies may allow human perception to change in such a way that we could perceive space and time differently. And if the future human, a homo mechanicus, if you want to call them that, if we implement cyb you know, cybernetics and cyborg technologies and these sorts of things to artificially enhance our technology and our ability naturally, our natural intelligence, if we do that and we reach that point in the future, and we literally augment our own perception of space-time and perhaps other things. Will we be may will we be rendered capable of perceiving things in our environment that we did not know to exist today? You know, for all we know, perhaps non-human sentient intelligences in our midst. Will we be capable of literally perceiving both the past and the future as though they were happening and occurring chronologically right now? Will it remove any need for there having to be time travel? And I think that if this is the case, it could very well be that certain high strangeness or Fortean or just otherwise unexplainable and anomalous occurrences that have been reported in the, uh, in the unexplained literature over the last several decades and really for hundreds of years, if we go back even further, I would argue that some of these greater instances of high strangeness may be explainable through future technologies along those lines interacting with humans who in our present day state couldn't interact with space and time in quite such an advanced or in an augmented way. And so with UFO singularity, that is what I'm trying to do is rather than saying UFOs are you know, guys from the future who've built time traveling machines and they're flying back in time, it may be that certain technologies that emanate from the future would be capable of influencing the present day or the past, and yet we may be able to perceive aspects of that, but the whole, the greater phenomenon continues to elude us. Once we get to that point where we begin to, and again I say when we begin to harness some of these technologies ourselves, in essence that would be what futurists of today call the singularity. We'll begin to modify ourselves and improve upon ourselves, take you know, evolution into our own hands. And I'll, I'll say this too, Sarai, and this is the last thing I'll say about, you know, within the context of the, the current question. Um, although I think that certain technologies that we would call singularity technologies, the merging of man and machine, or perhaps the creation of greater than human levels of intelligence at some point, I think they are inevitable to a point, but I don't know that I'm entirely comfortable with those kinds of things. I often draw criticism from folks for seeming to be an advocate of transhumanism and singularity. I'm not really, but as a journalist, I'm reporting about the facts and the trends in technological growth and, and, and the kinds of sciences that we're implementing today that I think are pointing in that direction. I talk also about how those things may augment our ability to understand UFOs in the future, but there's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad just as well. We have to take all these things into consideration. 
And and that's also just one possibility of what UFOs might be. I mean, there's so oh, yeah. many different. I mean, you had Jacques Vallée and John Keel both going with sort of the ultra terrestrial dimensional sort of explanation back all the way back in the late 60s. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, and something else that I think has to be taken into consideration, too. Again, when we talk about technological singularity, there's only maybe uh, a couple of other UFO researchers who, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certain that there are others who have thought about things along these lines, but the only ones that I know who have actually written about the interrelationship between what appear to be UFO technologies and singularity which we'll talk a little bit more in depth about in just a moment and how it relates to UFOs. The only two are uh, Nigel Kerner, who I interviewed for the book, and, of course, a good friend of mine, uh, Richard Dolan, who has written pretty extensively about singularity. And he and I were on a panel with Stanton Friedman at the Congress. And uh, uh, at some point during one of the questions, it's funny because here I've written a book called The UFO Singularity, but I wasn't the guy that brought that subject up in relation to ufology during the panel. It was Richard Dolan. And uh, and it's very interesting to me, and, and I'm, I'm pleased to know that there are ufologists to, you know, Rich Dolan is someone who is, I think, just as accepting of the extraterrestrial hypothesis as he is of the potential for future technologies, or what we might call post-singularity future technologies, you know, to be behind certain UFO phenomena. In likelihood, as you've alluded, it's probably a combination of both. But the funny thing is, is that, you know, ufology... Ufology, I think that we're, we're facing something that we know to exist. We know that UFOs are here. They are something. We don't know what they are. I'm skeptical so far as coming out and saying, I think they're this or they're, they're that. I don't think we can deny that there are apparently advanced technologies in our midst and that UFOs seem to represent a highly advanced uh, technology that is often aerial phenomenon. And, um, and, and at times other things just as well that kind of fall under the jurisdictions of what we call ufology. But I think that with regard to singularity, what's funny is that in terms of predicting technologies of the future, while UFOs are something that are, at least in part, existent, physical, and observable, and perhaps even capable of being studied here, present, and today, when we talk about singularity, this is something that's you know maybe a few decades away, at least the beginnings of it. And yet, scientists are far more accepting of something like technological singularity. Again, the creation of technologies or intelligence that exceeds natural levels of human intelligence. That's how the Singularity Institute would define it. Mainstream science is far more accepting of that mythos. I call it a mythos because it doesn't exist yet, and it's entirely speculation. And, and yet with UFOs, with it right here in our midst, they'll dismiss that because of the way that media and culture has downplayed the idea of extraterrestrial visitation when UFOs may not be that at all. And so I think what's funny is when we read books like The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil, I believe it was a New York Times bestseller, so don't tell me people out there haven't read it. Uh, you know, Kurzweil talks about how at one late stage in the game, the universe will wake up. And literally nanotechnologies and foglets and all these kinds of you know, highly advanced singularity tech, future technologies will literally begin to spread you know, the influence of humankind throughout the universe. Well, the problem with that, and granted Kurzweil, I should say he does you know, at times talk about extraterrestrials, but I still think that he largely misses the point in terms of, you know, well, if we were being visited by something and if UFOs were some evidence of that, could it be that they are perhaps a post-singularity technology from elsewhere? Which begs the question, if we humans are likely to develop singularity kind of technologies, artificial intelligence, you know, brain-computer interfaces and all these sorts of things, well, then would another technology elsewhere in the universe more advanced than us have already done the same thing? And would that explain how they could overcome the rigors of space travel to get here? So singularity doesn't remove from the equation extraterrestrial visitation as a realistic potential. If anything, it only bolsters the possibility that indeed extraterrestrials could overcome the kind of problems that once were the very elements scientists dismissed. We would say in the past, of course, that, well, you know, the, the, the trouble of traveling from even the nearest habitable star system, it would take, you know, several lifetimes, and that would be even moving at light speed, but of course aliens probably aren't going to be able to move at light speed because the compression factor in terms of traveling at that speed, you know, over physical space, it would literally kill them. They couldn't do it. And so, you know, a lot of these arguments have been made about why extraterrestrials couldn't visit Earth. In all likelihood, what we expect that humans will do in the future, if there are extraterrestrial technologies out there, they've already done that, some of them, not all of them. 
But, you know, if life exists out there, I would wager that the probability would dictate, at very least, that uh, some are more advanced than we are, others may not be. And those who are more advanced would have to have employed what we would call singularity technologies already. So, and if they haven't, and if we can dismiss all UFO reports and there's no evidence of visitation from elsewhere in the universe, then let's look at this from a different perspective. What if... There's no evidence, and the great silence, as scientists call it, is accurate, and we have no evidence of UFOs or, or rather extraterrestrial technologies. That seems to indicate to me that maybe some of the predictions about singularity are also off base, because if we think it's going to happen here, we should expect to see evidences of it elsewhere. So, again, I think that what looking at singularity in conjunction with UFOs does for us is it helps us present more logical and rational approaches to trying to understand you know, the pros and cons about UFOs. And maybe through looking at this a little bit more uh, uh, critically, I think it could help us to, you know, on, on the whole, understand some things about UFOs that we've perhaps overlooked in decades past. Well, it, it, it seems like at this point, with what we know about the UFO phenomena, it almost takes a willing blindness for, mm -hmm. the, for the ET, for the extraterrestrial uh, sort of theory to work because it doesn't make sense if you, if you take the whole picture into account. If you, if you, and this is the funny thing, there's this, you know, the, I guess you could actually cite the anthropic principle, but really I think that so many things are anthropomorphized that, uh, that really, uh, it's really just a matter of you know human perspective or uh, versus human projection of human ideals into everything that we view. I, I guess we're just you know, I, really, I think anthropocentrism would be the proper term for it because we we try and judge all possibilities and potentials existing in the universe relative to what technologies human ha uh, humans have at their disposal right now. And so in the past when we've tried to look at the potentials for extraterrestrial life visiting Earth, the way that humans have always interpreted this is on the grounds of technology that is maybe, you know, five, ten, or twenty years on down the road, a little just a little more advanced than what we have right now. I think part of that is innocently because we perhaps are at a point technologically where we are not advanced enough to even conceive what kinds of technologies we will be implementing in twenty years ourselves and therefore it becomes very difficult for us to presuppose what an extraterrestrial technology would do you know and there may be other reasons just as well but nonetheless you find that that anthropocentrism really filters into virtually everything that we do in relation to trying to seriously study and understand ufos and extraterrestrial phenomena or anything else like that and so in the past it has like you would kind of said a willful sort of ignorance or or you know a willful kind of blindness uh, is required because essentially people are willing to believe things that are put forward in human terms, whereas the <laughs> the believers are doing that, but the skeptics, on the other hand, are saying, "Come on, you really think that that kind of technology, something essentially you know not much more advanced than what we have at our disposal now, you really think that aliens are using that to visit Earth? Well, of course they're not, and that's why I'm saying we can't root ourselves on one extreme or the other ideologically. We have to come to the center. We have to really try and stretch our brains and think about, okay, what will we be employing a few years from now? What kinds of technologies can we not only predict but maybe even expect based on where technology is going today? I read a study, and I featured this on my Graylian Report podcast this week. <laughs> this is fascinating. A rat was anesthetized, and it was placed in a little in a little fixture of some sort basically that kept its head from moving around a whole lot and then a man had electrodes hooked to his forehead that allowed him to control a machine that was uh, configured remotely and by thought alone the man was able to direct uh, subsonic pulses at the at the rat's head which essentially interacted with the brain in such a way that the man was able to make an anesthetized rat which was not conscious itself but he was able to control the rat's tail by, influen it, by influencing its brain directly with his own thoughts. So what's interesting is this is entirely primitive, but this is maybe the first instance of a valid interspecies brain-to-brain uh, uh, -brain, uh, connection or, or what we might call, I guess, an interface. And in the, in the coming years, when we perfect and polish that kind of a technology, for instance, one thing that, that people hope uh, might be uh, you know, uh, employed in, along these lines, or let's say that there's a rescue mission 
in a forest fire and certain trained animals might be capable of being controlled by human thoughts so that these animals can get out there they're capable of moving climbing crawling flying and doing things that a human might not be able to do and yet they can aid greatly in in saving lives and, and preventing disasters and things along these lines and then of course let's think about machines what if a human can use a you know thought literally to con to uh, control the, the movements of a machine. So when we talk about brain-computer interfaces, we're seeing the very beginnings of that kind of technology right now. I'm very curious as to what and how that will be employed and what areas that will be employed in the coming years, and if they indeed improve upon, which inevitably, as long as technology on planet Earth is allowed to continue unhindered, <laughs> uh, inevitably these things will come about. It will be interesting in the coming years to see what kinds of implementations of brain-computer interfaces, uh, you know, brain-to-brain -brain interfaces between humans or even between different species, humans and other animals, or just from animal to animal for whatever reason. There may be, and this is a, a really, I think, a big ethical concern for many today, there may be a time where we literally take DNA and we take our own biology and we, you know, we supplement and we augment our own you know, physicality with information, genetic information from different animals to allow, for instance, physical night vision as opposed to having to utilize you know, clunky goggles and equipment in the field. Think about the super soldier of the year 2045 who's you know, literally born with night vision. You know, with with you know, who knows, a tail for use in balancing or something along those lines. You know, uh, prehensile you know claws or something along. I don't know if prehensile is the proper terminology, but you know, retractable claws. I mean, sounds like I'm describing an X-Men character <laughs> or something from a comic book. But if if it can be done, this is an argument that I've uh, you know talked about with a lot of people, especially for military purposes. I think it will be done, and in the coming years, these kinds of technologies are definitely going to not only change the way we physically interact with one another but it's going to change the way that we interact with reality and the way that we perceive the world around us. And it's going to be a brave new world, to borrow the, the axiom of, of Aldous Huxley. I just don't know if it's going to be entirely a good one. Hmm. All right. Well, we got to take a quick one-minute break, and we'll be back in a minute with Micah Hanks. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on Where Did the Road Go are their own and do not represent those of WVBR or its management. Join us on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com where you can send us questions for our live guests via email or the live chat room. You can also check out our upcoming schedule, blog, link section, book reviews, videos, and links to our Twitter, Facebook, iTunes, and much more. That's wheredidtheroadgo.com. All right, we're back on Where Did the Road Go with Micah Hanks. And uh, we've been discussing uh, the singularity. We've been discussing UFOs. And uh, what do you think? What do you make of uh, this this news article that's come out recently about Dr. Stephen Greer and his uh, disclosure project and this, this very tiny alien he claims to have? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, with with relation to that, first of all, the the, the little body that uh, Stephen Greer has is very similar to others that have been found. I think there was one dating back to around 1996 that had been found in the Urals region of Russia. There was a similar one that was found, I think, maybe around 1992, I believe, in Chile. Um, I had heard, perhaps, that uh, I'm, I, I can't confirm this. I don't uh, have specific knowledge as to where the body in Greer's possession actually came from. One source had said Chile. I could be wrong on that. But the point I'm making is that there are numerous instances where similar little bodies have been recovered over the years. I think that what we have to keep in mind in relation to this is that while testing can be done, and, and, and I, I ask the listeners please to hear me very carefully on this, while tests and other kinds of, of, of rigorous scientific studies can help us determine that this body, if what Greer is telling us is correct, may not be human. The fact that it is not human, that alone does not prove that it is extraterrestrial. And the problem, the logical fallacy that is being touted along with this, and I think largely to help promote this film, Sirius, that uh, not Sirius as in I am Sirius, but as in the planet Sirius, the star, uh, the, uh, if if you folks haven't heard about that, I think that maybe uh, the website, I think, is I, th I believe it's SiriusDisclosure.com, but don't take my word on that. But people can look it up. It's S-I-R-I-U-S, Sirius. And uh, 
I think that for purposes of promoting the film, it's much more convenient to say, yes, this little body, it's not human, and therefore we may have compelling evidence that we have an extraterrestrial biological entity, which is what Greer, in quotes taken from his own website, has said. He has referred to it as E.T. Again, let me stress that just because it's not human, that does not prove that it is extraterrestrial. And the reason why is because how do we, how do we judge you know, uh, something that is so similar to being a human – uh, or rather, what do we judge that by? Do we have an extraterrestrial body that we can compare this little body to uh, for purposes of determining conclusively that it is extraterrestrial in origin? If Greer is already sitting on an alien body that he has used for the comparison that I'm you know, uh, putting forth there, I'd like to know about that because that, my friend, is going to be the big story of the century. But the fact that he's got a little body, whether or not it's human, that alone is not enough to prove that this is extraterrestrial. And I think that what's important is that even though it's not pretend, it may not be extra, it could be extraterrestrial. We don't know, and we shouldn't say it's not before we or, or we shouldn't say it is or is not before we don't know. But in all likelihood, to my uh, way of thinking, it probably is terrestrial in origin. But if it is, and if it is not a human, that to me is almost as interesting and as truly perplexing as the idea of finding an alien. Because what is a small non-human entity of this variety? Where did it come from? And if it is from here on Earth, how have these beings at some point throughout history existed alongside humanity and yet largely unknown? Does this, does this grant further justification for such things as fairy folklore and you know legends that literally have been cited the world over in relation to little people, often described as spirit folk and things like that, which some people, Jacques Vallée and others, have actually appended to ufological studies from a folkloric perspective. I think that these are all important questions, and I think that the importance of an actual miniature non-human but nonetheless a humanoid entity i think that the implications of that kind of a discovery are obvious but we shouldn't jump the gun because i've seen no evidence and i doubt that even proving that it is non-human will in any way grant us conclusive proof that this creature is extraterrestrial in origin and if stephen greer or anyone else tries to come forward and say that it is they're wrong fair enough fair enough um, I think there was one in Mexico too that they were, that was similar to this but different because I believe it had a tail. Now, if that was the one that came about uh, and was popularized within the last few years, I can tell you with certainty that that was, I believe, a, a small rhesus monkey. Okay. Um, yeah, I and, think it was. And and that's the thing about this is that I have friends in certain circles. Jaime Masson, who I'd mentioned earlier, had actually been associated with that. I, as a matter of fact, I had a number of friends and researchers who tried to tout it and one even threatened to sue me because I came out at the very beginning and said, not only is this a rhesus monkey, or it appears to be a, something similar to a rhesus monkey, but my immediate concern is that this animal may have been tortured or harmed in the process of, of making it look like an alien. Uh, the, the, there were these allegations of testing, genetic testing, and all this stuff that, that supposedly went on and, again, confirmed that this little creature was indeed uh, you know, n unlike any known species, I, I tell you, that happens more often in this field than people are really aware. Uh, it's more easy to botch the conclusions of a, gen of a DNA test than people realize. Uh, and I think that what people need to take into consideration is if it looks like a monkey, it probably is a monkey. Um, I'm, I'm sad that there are so many otherwise reputable researchers in this field who've looked at that thing. And over the years, uh, some still believe that it is evidence of an extraterrestrial being. <laughs> it, first of all, wouldn't be evidence of anything extraterrestrial any more than what Greer claims to have right now, because how do we judge what is extraterrestrial? Something could look very much like an alien, but it could have been born someplace here on planet Earth. It could be some sort of, and I'm getting really far out there for purpose of illustration here, but it could be some sort of a subterranean species, you know. It could be some sort of a, a species of, of creature that lives in cave systems or something like that that is nonetheless, as Mac Tonys would have said, a crypto-terrestrial, a, a terrestrial being but something that was hidden here on Earth and maybe has somehow existed alongside humanity, at, you know, as yet undiscovered, like maybe like a Sasquatch or something like that. Um, again, we have no proof of the existence of any of these beings, but when and if something like that ever comes along, whether it be a little diminutive alien body, and I say alien because it apparently isn't human, or you know maybe something larger like the mythical Sasquatch that we hear about. Again, that doesn't prove ET exists. That only shows that there are things much like us, uh, and yet things that are enough unlike us to have fallen into the category of histories, mysteries, and mythology and outright folklore. Yet nonetheless, which have actually been very real 
uh, and, 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 and strangely have managed to exist alongside us. To me, that is just as fascinating as the potential for existence of extraterrestrial life. Because, Soraya, what happens if we find that, indeed, we are not alone on this planet and there have been other intelligent humanoid beings, non-humans as well, who have existed alongside us here on our own planet, in our own backyard? If that is proven... That means that we, before we go out looking in space for extraterrestrials, we need to be looking for more non-human species right here on planet Earth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what, what do you have any opinions on the DNA studies that are being done currently on the, the Sasquatch and the Bigfoot studies? It all seems to be bunked at present. Uh, you know, it's so sad because again, I I had seen many respected names in the field talking about how important. Uh, this study might be. If we had genetic evidence to support the existence of a creature like Sasquatch or Bigfoot, this would literally, you know, change not only science, uh, and on, you know, on the, in the broader use of the term, on its head. I mean, this is going to, you know, bring to into the equation many deep questions about, you know, anthropological studies, spirituality and religion, and all these sorts of things. I mean, th there are a lot of different interpretations of what the proof, the proven existence of Sasquatch would do for us. The problem is, is that the first question I had was, how do we have samples and enough samples, allegedly from a creature, to be able to prove that they exist by sequencing their DNA when no known living specimen of such a creature or a dead specimen for that matter is known to be in captivity anywhere or exist. Again, it's kind of like saying we've captured a ghost in a box and we can't see it and we can't touch it and we can't do anything but we know it's there. <laughs> we see time and time again people doing things like this, people making these bold claims but they have no direct evidence, no proof of anything uh, to, to back up these extraordinary claims that they're making. And so with Melba Ketchum and the DNA study that's uh, ongoing, uh, there are a lot of problems. One of the first big problems actually has to do with the fact that uh, Melba Ketchum, when she couldn't get the paper peer-reviewed, it's pretty well known now that she essentially acquired a uh, an online scientific journal, changed the name, and then self-published her paper, which I'm sorry, scientifically that is not peer review. That's self-publishing, and there's a big difference. And furthermore, uh, a number of skeptical writers uh, reviewing the paper found in the references uh, that uh, that Melba Ketchum had actually cited as sources one known April Fool's Day article, and then another that I think was, if it wasn't an April Fool's Day article, it was an article that was an obvious tongue-in-cheek hoax, uh, you know, that was essentially making fun of the entire mess uh, with regard to uh, equine studies. Uh, she, of course, is a specialist in horse DNA and, and the like with her, uh, I think, DNA Diagnostics is the name of her company there in East Texas, and that's what she specializes in. So she cited all these nefarious hoaxes as valid sources in her paper, and at least on two instances. And so what that leaves us to question is, did Melba Ketchum literally do that and, and didn't pick up on the fact that she was using bad information to support her, her you know, fundamental uh, you know, thesis, if you will? Or did she knowingly do it and was she just trying to pull everybody's leg? So the thing is, is it's really a shame because while I think a lot of people say that you know, they were hopeful and now this has discouraged them, I think that the scientific community that's always going to be initially skeptical of something like, well, maybe Sasquatch exists, you come forward with a claim like that, they're not going to take you seriously from the outset. I think that it's done a little damage in that sense, because every time we think we've got someone who's appearing to come forward from a credible background and seriously scientifically try and study all this, you know, they end up getting shot down because they went about it in a very bad way. And if at times <laughs> what can almost only be interpreted in Melba Ketchum's case as being a disreputable or perhaps a purposefully deceitful way with the use of these hoax papers. We might have been able to excuse that she'd used one in her cited sources. She used more than one and, you know, and then self-published the thing. So what's really going on there? Is she just trying to pull our leg? I've asked, actually asked myself that a few times and I've lost interest in the entire thing. It's just a real shame that there isn't more truly serious scientific research in that field. Well, I, I, I do believe, I, I heard her on Coast to Coast talking about it, and she said that every time she submitted it for peer review, it was often rejected out of hand simply because of the contents of it, which isn't really a surprising thing. I mean, a lot of people are not going to look at it no matter what because of the content. Yeah. 
Absolutely, and I think that that's true. Now, again, not to to you know attack, criticize, or to to try and defend her. Really, I in this instance, I do want to be agnostic. Melba Ketchum has made some extraordinary claims. What she's provided as evidence and the way that she's presented the evidence has not been a very uh, scientifically acceptable methodology that she has employed. But I will say that one of the uphill battles that she or anyone who claims to have evidence of the what many would call impossible, the kind of problem that they're going to inevitably encounter is this, that when you are coming forward with incredible claims, uh, you are going to be met with scientific skepticism. And if the claims that you are making are not backed by enough, you know, credible looking evidence, uh, you know, and, and cited from <laughs> credible sources in her case as well, you know, you're, you're not going to be taken seriously. Uh, le- le- and I'll say this, what might have changed things for her would have been rather than coming forward with apparently no proof of a fi- you know, physical biological specimen. Now, there had been claims that there was one, but this was part of something I think called the Erickson Project, and that too has been you know, mysteriously shady in terms of what they've actually allowed to be released uh, to the public. If, if someone had come forward with a study and said we've sequen- sequenced a Sasquatch's DNA and here is the dead specimen of the creature from which we extracted the, the DNA, um, we, we're not just going to provide you photographs. We're going to have a press release. We're going to have the thing right there. You can come. You can look at it. You can see it. Touch it. You'll smell it because it's dead. You know, or if it were alive and they had the thing, you know, in captivity and, and people were – linguists were working with it trying to find out if there was a language that Sasquatch has used – that's the kind of evidence I think that we're going to need. Before we come out saying that we have sequenced Sasquatch DNA and that we can prove to the world that this creature exists, let's see a living specimen because, again, it comes back to what I'd said initially. They had claimed that they had managed to obtain DNA from several specimens. I think if we're going to prove the existence of a creature like Sasquatch, we're going to have to see the specimen, alive or dead, first. Then you can sequence the DNA, and then you can present that paper to a scientific journal, but until you've got the actual creature and you're willing to come forward and say, yes, this is where we obtained the sample, this is where the DNA came from, this is what we have, You can see, it's here for all to see, it's a real living biological flesh and blood creature. Until that happens, science will never take seriously the study of Bigfoot, Sasquatches, and probably on the whole, cryptozoology. Well, there have been crypto crypto type creatures that have been discovered, prehistoric fish, things like that. But none of these major ones, like the Loch Ness monster or sea, you know, the various sea monsters in different lakes, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yeti. And why do you think that is? Do you think it's just mythological? Do you think they're out there? I think it's a combination. We we do know, as you pointed out, the coelacanth, of course, you know, was discovered in the 19 teens, maybe the first one, and then I think a second in the 1930s off the coast of Africa. Of course, the coelacanth is known to exist now, and that creature had been thought to be extinct since prehistoric times. The kraken, another fine example, and, you know, for cryptozoologists, they're probably yawning because these are such overplayed examples, but the kraken, of course, in mythology uh, was likely what is known to be the Architeuthis or the giant squid in modern in the modern day world. And these creatures, I read a recent scientific report about the giant squid and how these things get around. For a single species, those creatures are found in, in waters all around you know, the world in different parts of the world's oceans. And so these these are one variety of animal that really I mean they travel all over the place. But they uh you know, they're also accepted as a living species. Now when I was a child and I was reading about cryptozoology while it was known that the giant squid existed because of a couple of carcasses that had washed ashore, uh, you know, in a few instances, and I think also certain uh, portions of the bodies of squids that had been recovered from sperm whales and the like, you know, during whaling ventures and things, it was known that the, the giant squid existed, but there had never been a, a good photograph taken of one. There had never been anything like that until just maybe the last 10 years, and all of a sudden, within just a few years, uh, with the advent of the use of cell phone technologies and also deep sea rigs and things that can be monitored remotely utilizing underwater cameras, hydrophone arrays, all these sorts of things. Only within the last 10 years have we been able to implement technology in a way that has made it more simple for us to go into the habitat of an elusive creature like the Architeuthis or the giant squid to photograph and to study these creatures and to finally prove conclusively, yes, we not only know they exist, but here they are. We have them. We've even had a live one in captivity for a short time. They don't last very long when pulled up in a fishing net. But nonetheless, we've got the photographs and the physical specimens to prove that they exist. That creature, Soraya, was once also considered to be 
solely in the realm of mythology. We know now that they are actually biological creatures. They exist and they flourish throughout all parts of the world. Is it impossible that a creature like a Bigfoot or that creatures, many different creatures like Bigfoot could exist in different parts of the world? Is it possible physically for creatures like that to exist? I think so. Do we have proof of them existing in different parts of the world? Not at all. But if we implement, for instance, technology properly, can we hope to maybe discover once and for all whether there is validity to the claims of individuals who have said that they've seen these things? I certainly think that we can. And as to why, I don't think that a lot of the stories of cryptid creatures are provable versus giant squid or coelacanths or something like that. I think it has to do with one of two factors. Like you said, yes, they are mythological. And reporting over the decades of or misinterpretation of known species leads to for instance you know the tentacle of a squid rises from the ocean and it's interpreted as being the long neck of a of a saurian monstrosity from the jurassic period or something along those lines i think that misinterpretation could lead to mythology which supports the belief in the existence of creatures that are not actual physical actual you know specimens actual species and then i think that the other reason may be that Sometimes these creatures could indeed be um, very specialized in terms of the environment in which they live. One that fascinates me are the claims of a creature known to be, uh, well, alleged to exist around the Congo River Valley Basin. It's known by a number of different names, but the, the most popular is Mokelium Bimbe. Imileon Tuka, I think, is a, is a secondary name for that creature. These creatures are believed to be small, uh, about the size of maybe a rhinoceros, or maybe a hippopotamus, but they've got one feature that differentiates them from other creatures in the region. They've got a long neck, and they appear to be reptilian. They they sound like little brontosaurus-type right. creatures. And Mokalium bimbe is said to live right around an area called Lake Tele, and although there have been expeditions to get down into that portion of the Congo River Valley Basin, you know, Lake Tele is still, even by today's standards, very difficult to reach. And there have been, you know, civil wars and things like that that have literally politically ravaged that portion of the world and make it very diff difficult for guys like you or I to launch an expedition to go there and to talk to these to, to these natives and furthermore to get out there, spend a few weeks with cameras and with advanced technology on Lake Tele and once and for all prove whether dinosaurs may still exist in the heart of the dark continent. And so I think that the thing also that must be taken, taken into consideration is that for species like that to exist, they must be specialized in, in terms of their adaptation to a very special environment. That sort of an environment for them to exist often must be probably very, very difficult for humans to be able to reach, very remote. And it also may be that a creature like that is the remnant of something that has been dwindling in numbers over the last several hundred years. For all we know, a creature like Mokele and Bimbe may have existed. But by the time we get to Lake Telly, the best we may hope to be able to find is... You know, for instance, uh, you know, the remnants of a body, uh, you know, something, perhaps some bones or something along those lines that have managed to exist for a few decades, perhaps a couple of hundred years or, or, or better, in a cave or something like that. That alone would be an, an incredible scientific discovery. But, you know, again, it seems that we're not armed with enough technology to make readily accessible uh, our ability to, to, to reach and stay and study in those kinds of parts of the world where maybe there are actual what you would call prehistoric monsters that could still exist. So, you know, I think that it really is kind of a mixture of mythology and also just that these creatures are entirely elusive because of the way they've adapted to certain parts of the world and their environments. Hmm. Okay. Well, you you had mentioned the, the fairy faith and Jacques Vallée's theories on that being the same as the UFO, just a different, different uh, the same archetype but a different uh, overwhelming, I'm not getting the right word there, <laughs> a, different, a different face. Sure. On it. Um, do you think that the, the, the phenomena may interact with our consciousness in a way, which is why it always seems to be just a little bit ahead of us? Well, you know, I think that when we get into the realm of, of, of a strange non-physical or sim quasi or semi-physical intelligence interacting with us on an archetypal level, um, that gets well beyond what science is capable of proving right now. And so that's a difficult subject. Now, if I'm to speculate about it and tell you again what my gut feels, I certainly think that uh, there are instances where certain strange phenomena do seem to have uh, or do seem to display a very interactive capacity. Sometimes something that is not entirely physical and something that is at times and in certain ways interpreted or even outright determined by 
the subjective experience that the witness is experiencing. In other words, for instance, let's say that uh, you know five people see a UFO. Uh, four of them see a triangle-shaped thing, and then one person sees, you know, Mary Magdalene or Jesus <laughs> hovering in the sky. Uh, that sounds absurd, and you'd think that, no, 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 we're talking about a technological presence, some sort of an actual physical craft. It's not going to look different to one person than it does to another. But if you actually look into the, the, the wealth of reports in the body of ufological literature. Take, for instance, uh, Raymond Fowler's The Andreessen Affair, where Betty Andreessen talks about an abduction experience that by the end of the book is very religious. She, of course, being a devout Catholic, has this experience where a large bird catches on fire in front of her, burns into kind of this gray worm that arrives from the ashes, and, of course, tells her all these very spiritual things, even makes reference to my only son, which seems to be an overt reference to Jesus Christ from the Judeo-Christian faith. You know, I think that what we begin to see there, and, and the, the obvious symbolism of the bird burning, you know, is the, the phoenix, the the eternal symbol for death and rebirth. And in early Christian iconography, we even found that the, the, um, the phoenix was used as part of early Christian symbolism for that very reason. Um, it may not be still today, but I think that it stands to reason that there was something that was archetypal, and something that was probably largely psychological that was occurring in Betty Andreessen's mind, maybe not that she entirely made up everything that happened. Maybe she did have some truly anomalous experience, and we could even stretch our minds far enough to say that perhaps there was a, an interaction with a non-human intelligence, uh, one which I think she named Quasaga, if I remember correctly. I think that was the actual name of the little alien that she said came through her kitchen door. But I don't know that Every aspect of that experience was physical as reported by Betty. In my way of thinking, it stands to reason that the obvious, you know, religious overtones were symbological. You know, they, they were symbolic in nature and that they had more to do with her individual archetypal unconscious interpretation of something that was occurring. The entire thing could have been an archetypal unconscious psychological manifestation, if you will, a thought form of sorts. We, we may never know, but to discount the obvious symbolism that is presented in certain abduction and UFO reports like that, to discount that is doing us a disservice because I think that in order to fully understand this phenomenon, we do have to take into consideration that there may be something else occurring here and something that isn't always physical, something also that can interact directly with human thought and perhaps something that even at times originates from within the human mind. Okay. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about many UFO reports is so many of them are just lights. They're not actual crap. I mean, sometimes people see them crap, but more often than not, they see lights. Right. And I, and I often wonder if the lights are maybe not directly connected to the, the abduction accounts. For instance, maybe it's triggering a DMT release in our systems. Whatever's causing the lights is causing DMT to release in our systems and we're going into altered states, having an abduction experience and connecting it to directly to the light. Yeah, DMT, by the way, is just such a fascinating substance. Uh, you know, I, I wrote about it in a book I wrote years ago called Magic Mysticism and the Molecule. And uh, although I'm not a user of, of psychedelics or anything like that, I did write a, a pretty extensively about them in that book, uh, uh, both for purposes of maintaining journalistic in integrity. I didn't want to just sound like another, you know, uh, you know, guy who's out there having his own, you know, I'm, I'm a Don Juan or something like that, you know, or I'm interacting with some, you know, intelligence myself like Terrence McKenna and, and, and other popular writers who've discussed entheogens and things like that have done. You know, Terrence, of course, and his brother Dennis as well have uh, written a, a lot about their own personal experiences using dimethyltryptamine and, of course, going into South Africa and taking the ayahuasca, also known as the yage, which is the ceremonial brew that in some instances also incorporates dimethyltryptamine along with monoamine oxidase inhibitors that are found. And this is what's interesting. There's a tie-in with Mokele and Bembe here. I, I presume a lot of people wouldn't know about. If I, if I, believe, I, I believe that the two species of plant are actually one and the same, the liana is a plant that produces a flower that, according to the Congo um, natives, the Mokele and Bimbe favors as, as part of its diet. Uh, a plant also named liana, of course, which must be uh, uh, available in, uh, only in South America. Um, well, I don't know about only in South America. I know that they have the same name, though, is the point I'm making. The liana plant, Banisteriopsis capi, is also the plant which is capable of producing the monoamine oxidase A inhibitors that allow DMT to become orally active in the psychoactive 
uh, versions of ayahuasca. So I thought it was interesting that there's a tie-in between the liana. Maybe Mokele and Bimbe uh, is, is is out there in, in Lake Tele tripping somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but you know, that's when, when we're talking about the Amazonian varieties of ayahuasca, the liana, okay, the Banisteriopsis capi, is the component that is consistent from every different recipe to recipe. Certain varieties also utilize plants that are rich in DMT, and it's the liana that allows those, the vine, which grows throughout all parts of South America, that is what allows it to become orally active when taken like a tea as consumed with ayahuasca. So, and those experiences that Dennis and Tara, uh, Terrence wrote about are incredibly revelatory. But do they, you know, do the fractal mantoids, the self-dribbling basketballs, you know, the machine elves and all these little inhabitants, if you will, of the DMT hyperspace, do they actually represent archetypes or, or something from within the mind? Or are these literal interactions that humans are having on a non-physical plane with someone or something from someplace else? It really is too difficult to say. I think modern science would say it's all created within the mind. But what's interesting is that the, uh, the ethnobotanists and the, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the culturists and the people who've gone and actually been there and tried ayahuasca and tried other things just as well, tried um, ibogaine and other different kinds of hallucinogens, peyote, whatever, many of them feel that they have information imparted to them that seems to come from someplace else. And I'll wrap this up just by saying that you can't discount Carl Jung and his research uh, with that regard in terms of especially what was released just a few years ago, his red book, in which Jung was known to have induced hallucinations in his study uh, when he went through a period where he wrote pretty extensively about what he called a violent confrontation with his unconscious mind that he had. Uh, he would induce hallucinations so that he could actually interact directly with archetypes because apparently Jung had begun to hear voices and suffer from what I guess many modern uh, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists would call symptoms of a psychosis, you know, something along the lines of schizophrenia. Jung began to find that when he directly interacted with these archetypes, he not only cured himself, but he felt at times that there was information that seemed to come from a place that was not from within his own mind, which is so similar to the experiences of the DMT users and the other psychonauts, the users and experiencers. There is possibly that, that interpretation that it does come from the mind, but as Jung had suggest, uh, suggested previously, that there is an unconsciousness, a collective that sort of connects all humans, and that there is sort of a repository for knowledge that somehow connects all of us, and that at times, when given the right circumstances, we can draw from creatively uh, and otherwise. And so if we have that kind of a creative resource and we can reach into the unconscious and draw from things that we don't actually have physically in our mind, I have to you know wonder whether the notion of the uh, you know the uh, the ancient idea of the akashic record and things like that might not have some sort of a a physical psychological sort of substructure to to validate it i don't know that there's necessarily an actual universal library that we can tap into but maybe there is some sort of an unconscious a collective that humans are nonetheless not maybe just humans but maybe all living things are sort of kind of uh you know connected by who, who knows and that was kind of the crooks of Jung's research I find it interesting because in certain ways it's very similar to the reports of the DMT users hmm. okay well maybe maybe it's also uh, like uh, Rupert Sheldrake suggests the, the morphic field that yeah. we're tapping into yeah exactly which I think in many instances a lot of these are just different cultural and scientific interpretations of what amounts to being the same thing yeah well that makes sense um now, uh, your book of obviously is available on Amazon and all anywhere. I'm um, all the normal places. I'm assuming. Yeah, absolutely. And and you can be old fashioned and walk right into a bookstore and buy it just as well. Okay. And how many books do you have out total? Well, uh, I've got three right now. Of course, I've got a couple other things working. I've been sp talking with the publishers about doing another thing. New Page have been very gracious in helping uh, you know promote and uh, and uh, and get the UFO singularity out to people. But if they're interested in my research into psychedelics and altered states of consciousness, there's a book called Magic, Mysticism, and the Molecule. I have a very uh, probing and critical look at ghostly phenomenon, uh, which uh, kind of has to do with a, an antebellum mansion uh, that I actually, just before this uh, this interview, I actually was there visiting with the owners, just checking up and asking if there had been anything happening. And uh, the owners and I are both of the mind that we don't think that literal physical spirits of the dead haunt Reynolds Mansion, but there's something 
going on there. I think our interpretation, our collective interpretation of quote unquote ghostly phenomena is a bit different. And the book about that is called Reynolds Mansion, An Invitation to the Past. So all three, UFO Singularity, Reynolds Mansion, and Magic Mysticism and the Molecule can also be found at GraleyandReport.com. That's my website. You want to spell that for people? Sure, yeah. It always helps. <laughs> it's G-R-A-L-I-E-N Report. Dot com. And, and, you know, you can also access articles, podcasts, all kinds of stuff, which is made available for free right there on the website. And one thing I do ask people to consider, uh, between now and probably actually just a few days from the date f- during which this, this program is airing, uh, we, uh, my friend Scotty Roberts and I, who each year we do the Intrepid Magazine Paradigm Symposium, uh, we're also working right now with an Indiegogo campaign to try and launch our Intrepid Magazine Endeavor. This is an alternative news source that doesn't just talk about the paranormal. It's it's an alternative approach to politics, history, science, religion, all these sorts of things as well. And so the kinds of subjects that we discuss on fine programs like yours that I feature at the Grayley Interport that we have featured in the digital issues of Intrepid Magazine and, of course, that we discuss at events like Paradigm Symposium that I host in Minneapolis each year, you know, these kinds of things I think are meaningful. Often they are dismissed by the scientific mainstream, and what I ask people is that if you enjoy these sorts of things, but a logical and probing, reasonable and scientific approach to studying seriously the mysteries of our universe, I just implore people to take a look. If you go to GraleyInReport.com, you'll see in the right-hand side of the page that there's a little button with an intrepid mag, uh, and then, of course, there's the Indiegogo logo. You can click right on that. It'll take you to our page. Read about what we're about, and if it means something to you, you know, it's so helpful, even small amounts, if folks are willing to donate a little to help us get Intrepid Magazine a little closer to print publication and widespread circulation. And, you know, I thank people in advance for considering their their help with that. Now, now when is your in, Intrepid conference? The uh, Intrepid uh, uh, Conference, which is the Paradigm Symposium, that is the weekend of October the 17th through the 20th in Indi- or, or Indianapolis. It's Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, people can learn about that online at ParadigmSymposium.com. And I'll tell you, it, it may only be uh, April, but uh, we, are, we are selling tickets quickly, so people may want to go ahead and look into that. We've got great speakers lined up. Robert Baval, uh, Scott Walter of the History Pro- uh, Channel program America Unearthed, Giorgio Sukalos of Ancient Aliens, Nick Redfern, uh, you know, many, many, many others. And, of course, I'll be speaking on who knows what. It may be UFOs. It may be ancient history. It may be any number of things this year. But that's ParadigmSymposium.com if folks want to learn more about that. All right. Well, I I thank you for uh, doing this interview with us. And it's been a fascinating conversation. (laughs) Well, thank you, Soraya. I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, I guess we're going to take you out with some Psyche Corporation. Last Exit for the Lost is up next. Thanks, Micah. Thank you. Come in. Come in. Do you need me? Do you understand the numbers pouring over your connection? To perfection. Five, eight, three. Have you heard the singing soaking into our transmission? Twenty-one, thirty-four, fifty-five, eighty-nine, one hundred and forty-four. Into the heart of the universe.
Chambers number 1597 And counting 